Hey folks, I'm Matt and welcome to The Good Trouble Show, holiday edition. Like many of you, we are enjoying time with family and friends during this holiday season and we will be back with interviews mid-January of 2024. So in the meantime, we thought we would do a video rewind with some of my favorite interviews from 2024. Just this week, we posted part two of our exclusive phone interview with Robert Hastings, author of UFOs and Nukes, Extraordinary Encounters at Nuclear Weapons Sites. We had lots of comments on YouTube asking, where is part one? So here it is from October 29th, 2023, part one of our exclusive interview with Robert Hastings with commentary from our good friend from Disclosure Team, Vinnie Adams. Enjoy and happy holidays. Hi, Matt, and welcome to The Good Trouble Show. As many of you know, the UFO issue is being seriously considered by our lawmakers in Congress. They have mandated the creation of a UFO office in the Pentagon called Aero. They've passed legislation protecting UFO whistleblowers and a whole lot more. This year alone, legislation regarding UFO crash retrieval, back engineering programs, and legislation created by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer that would establish an advisory board in the White House on UFOs is in the works. Congress now realizes that, guess what, they've been lied to by the Pentagon and the intelligence community for a very long time, and they are pissed. Lawmakers, however, may not realize that the United States Air Force has lied to them about something really big. So, Senator Schumer and Speaker Johnson, what are you going to do about this? Declassified U.S. government documents and witness testimony from former or retired U.S. military personnel confirm beyond any doubt the reality of ongoing UFO incursions at nuclear weapons sites. The invention of nuclear weapons. For the first time, all-out warfare risked not only the destruction of civilization, but the radioactive poisoning of the planet itself. Mankind's future never looked bleaker. Evidence uncovered by researchers confirms that technologically advanced observers, whose identity and intentions remain unknown, began to monitor the nuclear standoff almost from the start. As this object passed over the missile site, we would start getting erratic indications on that missile. The bad thing was we also got a launch indicator. My name is David Shinley. My name is Galen King. I'm a retired Air Force Major. My name is Chris Fenstermacher. John Earnshaw. Philip Moore. And I have uh, given permission for the things that I have to say to be used in this production. The UFO did, in fact, shut down several missile silos in Montana. Strange lights in the sky making odd maneuvers. Five to six oblong lights stacked on top of one another, just outside the gate. Big white object that was cigar-shaped. And said, sir, for lack of a better description, there's a flying saucer hovering over that missile. That object did things that no airplane, helicopter, or any other system that we had in existence could do. It fired a beam of light at the warhead, and he said, Lieutenant Jacobs, you are never to speak of this again. It never happened. So in 2008, uh, his book, UFOs and Nukes, Extraordinary Encounters, oh, wrong one there, Extraordinary Encounters at Nuclear Weapons Sites. Uh, here's the book here, actually, now here it is. Uh, his book, UFOs and Nukes, Extraordinary Encounters at Nuclear Weapons Sites, documented hundreds and hundreds of cases of UFOs tampering with and or disabling our strategic nuclear weapons. Uh, today, we, are, uh, we will play the first part of a telephone interview I had with Mr. Hastings in 2022, and hopefully members of Congress or their staffers are watching right now. Joining me today to bring his perspective on this UFO and the, uh, on this uh, interview, sorry, I can't talk, this uh, interview and the UAP UFO topic at large, 
please welcome a good friend of the show, host of the fantastic show, Disclosure Team. Please welcome Vinny Adams. Vinny, how are you? I'm good, Matt. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure. Excellent, excellent. How, uh, how are things across the pond there? Yeah, all good. Thank you so much. Yeah, busy as always. <laughs> It, exactly. So, um, so uh, let's see here. Now, before we dig into uh, this interview that I had with Mr. Hastings, and again, this is the first part of a of an interview. I've known Mr. Hastings for quite some time. I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit, and also get into. Um, uh, you know, why he, he doesn't do uh, interviews right now as far as podcasts and whatnot. But, uh, but first, you know, there have been a lot of things that have taken place since this uh, whistleblower, David Grush, has come forward. Uh, Congress, I think, is really amped up about it. What, what can you uh, sort of tell us about the happenings that have taken place since Grush? Yeah, I mean, I guess initially after the, the story broke and, uh, you know, David Grush became known in this subject, we obviously had the July 26th congressional hearing where he, you know, he testified under oath, which has then led on to a sort of flurry within Congress to get access to a lot of this information, you know, especially with the House Oversight Committee and a lot of the members not actually having the, the relevant clearances to really get into the, you know, the, the weeds about the information that David Grush has presented to the DOD Inspector General, the in Inspector General of the Intelligence Community. And so, you know, it was only last week that this, uh, this SCIF meeting finally happened. But at the end of the day, it turned out to be pretty much nothing because nobody was really given the opportunity to see the relevant data due to these clearance issues. And so it seems to be an ongoing battle that's happening at the moment. And I understand too. I, I read somewhere on Twitter, and I've been a bit bit out of the loop lately. That that uh, I, some either senator or congressman it has put up legislation that would reinstate David Grush's security clearance. Obviously, when he left government, he went through a readout process where he was told what you know what not to speak about or what he had been read into. And then, obviously, in the readout process, these are the things that you agreed uh, not to speak about. Uh, sign again on the dotted line, and if you cross that red line, we're going to come after you. Uh, I, do you know any more about that? I saw a very uh, quick blip about it. No, I'm probably in a pretty similar situation. I've not seen that much about it, but these are the sort of things that we need to align to be able to get this process to continue moving forward in a, you know, in a, a clear and persistent way, let's say. I think, uh, you know, if we're just having these roadblocks that we keep hitting along the way, then this is why things seem to be taking quite a long time with regards to getting this information into the relevant hands. Yeah, I couldn't couldn't agree more. So, so let's dig into this whole issue of UFOs and nukes. Um, you know, so kind of giving you a bit of background on and how this interview uh, came about. So, I, you know, I've really been interested in this topic. I think since I was like nine years old when I saw Close Encounters of of the Third Kind, um, and then. Later in my early years in college, I, I began studying Russian and U.S. nuclear policy, just kind of separate of the whole UAP issue. So uh, you, uh, Russian and U.S. nuclear policy, I've, I've written op-eds about it uh, in particular uh, lately, and uh, um, or, or actually you know, prior to, or right at the beginning of, of the Ukraine, and, uh, Ukraine war. And then I also wrote a article for the debrief talking about how this nuclear issue in regards to UAP was, in my hypothesis, hypothesis <laughs> tongue-tied today, uh, is one of the key reasons that the Air Force has continually lied, uh, not only to the American people, but the people uh, in Washington that are, that are supposed to legislate and run our country. And, uh, you know, my argument was, well, how, you know, how can they make informed policy decisions, not only in the executive branch, but in the uh, legislative branch, if the military is flat out lying to them, the Pentagon. And back in, I think it was 2007, I came across, before I really got involved in it as far as political activism, I read the, the book UFOs and Nukes, which I attempted to uh, put the cover up earlier. Uh, and, and it completely blew me away. I had not uh, heard of, of this um, 
sort of phenomenon interfering with our strategic nuclear weapons. And in the YouTube description, folks, uh, there is a link to Robert Hastings' book, uh, as well as the documentary, which we showed you just a second ago, the trailer for. Um, so anyway, in, in 2022, I decided to begin uh, so, uh, sort of messaging on the UAP topic. Most of my audience at the time uh, were certainly Democrats, and uh, we found that it, the UAP topic was something that tested well among Republicans, but not Democrats. And that was when I decided, you know what, I need to message to my, my side of the aisle. And um, I had, as I mentioned, I'd written this article for the debrief uh, regarding the Air Force and nukes. And uh, shortly thereafter, I decided to reach out to the author of UFOs and Nukes, Robert Hastings, and surprisingly, he returned my email. And that uh, began, this is early 2022, I think in February, that began uh, really a pretty long relationship with Mr. Hastings. I would consider him a friend and am honored that he has uh, been so generous with me uh, with his time and information and guidance. And, and I also think as well, we would not be here today and things would not be happening in Congress uh, with the UAP topic if it weren't for the hard work of people like Mr. Hastings that, that really have gotten us, uh, gotten us to that point. So anyway, so I decided to try and do a sort of expose on Robert uh, Hastings. I, I pitched it to the debrief and then they stopped returning my emails for some reason. So uh, it kind of fell off the radar and it wasn't until about three, four days ago, going through my hard drive, I came across these recordings. So. Um, I've split this into two, uh, into, and it's going to be in uh, two shows. So this will be part one. Uh, I split it because I thought it was, it was, um, it says a lot for people to kind of digest. And I think it's important that everyone um, pays attention to this, especially lawmakers in Capitol Hill. We do know that, that um, you know, uh, some staffers uh, watch our show and pay attention to what we're doing, as do some folks on Capitol Hill. And I'm sure they, uh, that is the case uh, for your show as well. Other, other people, uh, or other activists such as yourself, really working to bring, bring this uh, truth uh, forward and, and say, to, you know, hey, uh, the, the folks that uh, are running the world, but it's time to, um, you know, to, to come clean about all of this. Anyway, so as I mentioned earlier, Robert uh, does not do um, live podcast interviews, what's sort of not publicly known, uh, and he has given me permission to share this, is that he, he has been very ill for quite some time with, um, uh, with um, uh, heart disease. And uh, it can be very difficult for him. You know, he and I uh, speak uh, via text and then also on telephone, and it, it, it can, can be difficult for him to speak for long periods of time without uh, being winded. Uh, so anyway, so we, we, uh, I, I came across this recording. I reached out to Robert and said, hey, I forgot I even had this. It has some really great information that I think the public would love to hear about. Are you okay if I air this? And he uh, said yes. So what we're going to do here, we're going to play the entirety of this interview. And Vinny, I thought you and I would just kind of make some notes as we go along. And then uh, afterwards, this interview, we're going to play about 35 minutes of it. And, uh, and I thought, Vinny, what we, what we would do is uh, provide some commentary after the fact. So uh, let's roll the interview, and um, yeah, here we go. Firstly, how, how have you been? We, we haven't chatted in a while. Uh, well, you know, I have an ongoing situation, so right. uh, between the condition itself and then the, the effects of the meds, I'm pretty much a zombie these days. Um. Uh, I've been trying to been trying to work on a third book for two years now. I got a couple of chapters written, but my productivity is just near zero, so I don't know if it's gonna get done. Um, before we continue, I need to mention that, uh, you know, I've had ongoing telephone problems and email problems from unseen persons. Is it NSA, CIA? I don't know who, but anyway, your uh, last several emails go straight to my spam folder, and that's one of the tricks they do. Uh, if you are expecting an email from me and you don't get it, check your spam folder because it could be there. Um, and there's a very good chance that 
please shift you to be that before our call and someone will interrupt the call today. Yeah. It may not happen, but it happens on a regular basis when I'm talking to, to journalists or veterans or other researchers. So that's the games that they play, you know. Sure. No okay. Big deal. Yeah, no, of, of course. Uh, yeah, I think I mentioned to you after... Uh, probably after the first couple of phone calls uh, that we had, I started getting clicking and and weird echoing on my on my cell. So uh, sure. yeah, so that so that doesn't doesn't surprise me, and I'm not intimidated by it. So um, yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, just kind of com- completely separate. Is is there anyone kind of uh, you know not knowing fully your your whole health situation is there is do you have somebody that is going to pick up the torch when when you're no longer able to to keep going with it if you don't mind me asking uh probably not um I, i'm in touch with a few people but i i don't think anyone's prepared to actively proactively go out and seek veterans to go on the record uh no one's expressed that intent to me anyway but um my files and uh, computer records and so on, everything's going to my editor, Brian Alley, who lives in Canada. He's edited both of my books, very awesome. intelligent. Uh, but I just asked him, you know, after I passed to, um, at some point, try to find some way to get all of that out to the public, uh, you know, in various venues, whether online or you know, uh, lots of researchers leave their uh, their files to universities. I don't think we've talked specifics, but, you know, I think I've pretty much done what I'm capable of doing in this lifetime. And if someone wants to pick up the torch, as you call it, uh, you know, that's sort of out of my hands at this point. Uh, second question. So, so, uh, so I told you about this piece. Uh, one piece that I had also pitched to the debrief that they were interested in was just kind of a, a, a profile on you. Um, yeah. And and I, I I seem to recall that uh, that uh, there's kind of a. Or you, I, I seem to remember that you can, uh, that you'll get worn out after a period of time on the phone. So just wanted to see what what your time was like and um, uh, a tolerance that kind of thing. It, it would be great to just sit and talk about all of it uh, if you have that bandwidth and, and energy. I've sort of discovered that over time that uh, after about an hour, I'm just I'm gasping for breath and so on. Okay, I completely. Uh, breath, breathless, breathlessness is another key symptom of heart failure. So. Okay. Well, then let's we'll we'll yeah. stay we'll stay focused on 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 the immediate thing, and then uh, and then maybe we can circle back on uh, at another time about uh, yeah. about the piece. I th- I think it's important that um, people that may not be you know one one thing i've kind of noticed with with the uap thing much as with myself even though it's something i've started reading about when i was uh, nine years old in 1978 is there a lot there are a lot of newcomers to this that that uh have have new uh, that are that are interested in the subject but they don't have the historical background on it and i think uh i think your efforts in in particular uh yeah, I think that that's a story people um, uh, should know about and know uh, how you helped move the needle in, in the whole conversation. Well, not so much, you know, focusing it on me per se, but you, if you don't have a, have a history of the situation, it's hard to evaluate what's going on now. I mean, so many of these skeptics, um, ranging from, you know, scientists to, uh, let's say, persons in Congress, you know, and and even just the public in general, they're saying, well, are these crap Chinese or Russian technology? And if you realize that the very same craft uh, maneuvers, speeds, you know, radar signatures, all of it, the whole nine yards, if, if you look at what's going on now, it's identical to what went on in the 1940s. It's highly improbable to claim that these are, you know, man-made craft in 2022, let alone 1945. So it, to claim that this technology was Russian or Chinese back in the 40s it is absurd, nothing less than absurd. And if people don't have an understanding of the, the continuity decade after decade after decade, that 
uh, appreciation is lost that, you know, this technology is so vastly beyond uh, human manufacture, uh, even now in 2022, let alone in the 1940s. What was, so, um, what was, and I, and, and I've, I read your book, but it's, it's been quite a long time and it's just kind of quicker for me to, uh, cause I need to get this out in the next uh, few days to just a- answer these questions. So, uh, I know a lot of this would be, be in your book. Um, what, uh, what was the, what was your motivation to begin looking at this particular angle? The, the uh, nuclear angle. Well, I- my, my father was career Air Force, and in 1966-67, he was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana, which is a nuclear missile base. And uh, he was aware of, he worked in a facility that involved radar, uh, NORAD, uh, North American Aerospace Defense Command radar systems. Um, the Air Force was part of that operation. And he was aware of trackings of anomalous aerial craft that were maneuvering near nuclear weapon sites, missile sites, uh, ICBMs, you know, Minuteman missiles southeast of the base and other places around the base. Coincidentally, even though I was a junior in high school, uh, he had gotten me a job as a custodian in the base air traffic control tower. This opening came up and I was 16 going on 17 and I needed to make a little extra money, uh, you know, for things that a teenager would want. And so I worked three nights a week in the air traffic control tower, just emptying trash cans and, and sweeping and mopping and so on. And one of the rooms that I cleaned in the tower was called RAPCON, which is radar approach and control. And it was manned by FAA controllers and some Air Force controllers. And over the course of a few months, uh, I made the acquaintance of a man named Bob Grasser, G-R-A-S-S-E-R, and he was an FAA supervisor. And during his work breaks, he would very graciously answer my many questions about radar, how radar worked, and so on and so forth. And in the break room, he would draw diagrams for me and so on. So I already had a bit of a relationship with him. And one night when I was cleaning, I entered the RAPCON room, and when when I went to his console and emptied his trash can, he kind of motioned to me and pointed to a screen and said, we're tracking UFOs. Now, he may have said something like unknowns, which is the proper formal term for anything that's not really identified. Uh, and, but anyway, he made clear to me these were unknown targets of some kind. And as I recall, after all these years, I kind of got excited and began peppering him with questions. And his whole matter just immediately changed. I think I was drawing attention to this. Uh, you know, there were other people standing or sitting at their consoles and, you know, they probably were wondering what was going on there. So he very quickly kind of backed off and said, we've got a situation, come back and clean later. Well, I cleaned the rest of the tower. And when I came back about two hours later and I, I brought up, you know, to, to, to do the room, wrap time, I, I briefly said something like, you know, what was that about? you know, the, what you showed me on the screen, and he clearly didn't want to talk about it. So um, I asked him, I worked every other day, the next time I went in for work, I asked him in the break room, you know, were, were you tracking UFOs? And he clearly didn't want to talk about it. So uh, that sparked my interest, and uh, when I learned from my father that they were tracking at this other facility, the NORAD radar facility, they were also tracking targets, not only at the tower, but in the the Air Force facility, Uh, then, you know, I knew something was going on. And I was pretty intrigued by all of that. Um, By, I think it was 1973 or four, uh, a researcher named Raymond Fowler, um, who worked as a civilian for Sylvania Corporation, but uh, worked on the Minuteman program. Sylvania was contributing various components to the Minuteman system. Because of that fact, uh, Fowler, Ray Fowler had contacts at Malmstrom, and um, they were telling him that disc-shaped objects, UFOs, were hovering above ICBMs, and that the ICBMs were malfunctioning at that time. Now, once I read that in print in, I believe it was 74, uh, I went, holy crap, 
you know, that's that's what was going on back at the base in 57. And so shortly thereafter, I began actively seeking out Air Force veterans. I didn't go after any active duty personnel. Um, I thought that would be uh, potentially dangerous for their careers. You know, um, if they if their superiors learned they were talking to me about these sensitive matters. So little by little, one by one, I, I encountered and sought out uh, a number of Air Force veterans. Uh, I've, I've interviewed 167 at this point in time, and that ranges from uh, air, uh, missile uh, launch officers, missile targeting officers, missile maintenance personnel, and missile security guards. Um, you know the air, the uh, security policemen, all of whom had their own stories about witnessing UFO activity at ICBM sites. So. Uh, I don't know why I have been so obsessed by this over the years, but at this point, uh, it's widely acknowledged that I'm the leading expert on this topic, uh, UFO incursions at nuclear missile sites. Uh, I sent a link a couple months ago in which Lou Elizondo, former head of HF, actually went on a podcast and said that my book uh, was used by HF because it was such a resource. I had spent decades getting these testimonies on the record, and it gave them a leg up in terms of getting an overview, uh, look at the big picture of this particular subject, UFO incursions at nuclear weapon sites. And so Lou is on camera saying that I did a fantastic job, quote unquote, with uh, pursuing the topic. So. Uh, I'm also in touch with some other former high-level persons that I, I'm not going to identify on the phone uh, who have said the same thing, that behind the scenes, apparently people both in the military and the intelligence community were aware of my work and were actually referring to it because I was doing the, the legwork. I was doing the you know um, research that they either could not do or was being kept from them due to classification. So it feels good at this point in my life to know that I contributed, you know, some, some valid data that not only the public, I think, would benefit from, but persons in government uh, have told me they actually were, were uh, using as a source, a reliable source of information. Uh, so when you when you were at uh, Momstrom, uh, uh is that, was that, I'd have to go back and look at my notes, was that the base Solace was at, or he was at another one? Correct. In fact, we were there at the exact same time my dad was stationed there. Um, based on what Salas, you know, he and I have been in touch for many years, and he is guesstimating that uh, the incident that he was involved with took place probably late evening between 10 p.m. and midnight. Sometimes he actually says it could be a little bit after midnight, well, I worked at the air traffic control tower from about 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. And based on the time frame, I, I know the months that I worked there and I know the time of day that I worked there, it's quite conceivable that what I witnessed, what the controller, the FAA controller, Bob Grasser, was showing me on radar was related to Bob Salas' incident. Proving that, you know, being able to validate that, uh, you know, corroborate that beyond any doubt is probably impossible. But the other incident at Malmstrom uh, was two, about a week earlier, eight days earlier than the incident that Salas was involved in. Uh, he was at Oscar flight here. The earlier incident was at Echo flight. And we know from a couple of declassified files that the earlier incident occurred at 8.30 in the morning, which couldn't have been what I witnessed because I worked there in the evenings. But uh, there were, we know from Raymond Fowler and, and various bits and pieces that there were ongoing incidents all through 66 and 67 at Malmstrom of uh, these things flying near the missiles, these craft flying near the missiles. So it's, it's uncertain. Uh, as to which incident I, I witnessed on radar inadvertently. But, um, yeah, so Salas, Salas was there at the same time my dad was stationed there. And there's, I, in my view, uh, at least some, I would say a fairly high probability that what I witnessed on radar was the incident that Salas was involved in. Do you recall exactly how many uh, targets uh, you observed? Five. And they were in 
they were clustered together in an irregular formation. It wasn't like a geometric grouping, but it was. They were clearly together. And as I recall, if you look at the radar screen, it's a circle, right? And right. I recall they were in what we would call the upper right quadrant or northeast quadrant of the radar screen, and <clears throat> clearly clustered together. Um, but again, I only saw them in this discussion with the controller took place, uh, uh, took probably no more than a minute before I started <laughs> peppering him with questions and he kind of backed off when I responded sort of, uh, you know, I was, I was in, I, I think I was drawing attention to this. And, and he, and in my book, I have a whole chapter devoted to later interviews I did with FAA controllers at Almstrom. And they confirmed there were multiple trackings of UFOs. Um, if you look at the chapter, it's called Leaving Tracks and referring to radar tracks. And um, you'll see the, uh, you know, I tape record interviews with witnesses. And so I just included verbatim what they said, these various controllers. They were aware of uh, you know, multiple incursions by these unknown targets near the missile site. Do you... And, um, do you yeah, do you recall any information altitude or speed? No. Um, there there was what this from my father who was at what was called the Sage building. This was the the NORAD related facility all caps S A G E. Uh I believe it's semi auto uh semi automated ground environment and it just had to do in technical terms with the way the radar was interconnected with uh, various facilities around the country, not only in the U.S., but Canada, um, again, under the auspices of NORAD, uh, which would track ostensibly tra track Soviet bombers in time of war. Uh, any incursions uh, of bombers or aircraft over the pole during a, a break, you know, war broke out, that radar system was designed to track them. Now, at some point, when my father and I were discussing what he had heard, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure this part of the conversation had to do with me questioning him many years later, but I recall a mention of the fact that they could track, at Sage, they could track um, the altitude of the objects, and the, these objects apparently were near the Earth and rising vertically at enormous speed. That's all I recall after this much time, based on comments my father made to me. But at the, F at the tower, the FAA scopes, uh, they were just search radars. They could tell you geographically where these, where these points were, but they didn't track. Um, it's called height finding radar. They had height finding radar at SAGE, but they did not have that at, at the tower. What did your dad do there again? Uh, his his office was in this building because he was in uh, what's what gen generically would be called supply. It was logistical support, and in his uh, resume after he retired, um, when he was presenting his work history to future employers, uh, civilian employers, I remember him listing uh, he was providing logistical support for a number of uh, radar squadrons and fighter jet fighter squadrons. And I, in my book, I quote the exact number. It's in, I believe, the introduction, the introductory chapter, the number of radar squadrons that he worked with and the number of uh, fighter squadrons that he worked with. And so I guess the Air Force logically put his office in the building where all the radar people were. So he would have you know, daily interface with them if necessary. What What was the very first uh, significant case uh, that you that you covered? Was it the Salus one? Um, chronologically, I'm not sure because you know, I mean, no, Salus would have come later. You know, all I knew, basically, what I've already described thus far was to some understanding that I had of what went on at Mountstrom in 67. So it was well into the 90s before uh, I, for example, interviewed, uh, or at least in the late 1980s, but I believe it was 93 or so, before a man named Robert Jamison, who, uh, Bob Jamison, 
who also spoke at my press conference in 2010, and you know the one that CNN covered. Uh, Bob Jamison was a missile targeting officer, and he gave me a wealth of detail that uh, clearly related to the incident at Oscar Flight, and I actually put him in touch with Salas, and the two of them compared notes and went, you know, this is the same incident. So, um, you know, I, in, in some cases, I could proactively reach out to veterans if I had heard about their you know, their previous assignments in, at missile bases. But often uh, during the lecture circuit era when I was speaking, Jameson showed up at a lecture I did in California, uh, College of Merced, I believe, and was just in the audience and, you know, came up to me afterward and said, you know, you and I need to talk. And that's when he went into uh, a great deal of detail about his part in the three missiles after they were dropped, after they declined. Um, in my book, the chapter called Taking Down Echo and Oscar is the chapter in which I describe all the statements. You know, again, I had Jameson on tape, uh, two, two hour long interviews, uh, which I've combined in the book. And uh, again, I quote him verbatim. You know, this is recorded testimony that I transcribed and included in the book. So the Malmstrom case, per se, in 67. I mean, there were many Malmstrom cases over several decades, but the ones that have gotten most of the attention, the one that was mentioned in the congressional hearing recently, uh, and they referred to it as a single incident. There were actually multiple incidents, but they were clearly, the congressperson was talking about Salas's incident, because he's the one that's been beating that drum for many years now, and giving lectures and interviews about his incident at, in uh, March. Oh, by the way, Jameson, uh, we pinned down from Jameson's testimony that the incident occurred on March 25th. Salas had previously been, uh, based on his recollection of events, previously was saying that it occurred the same night as the Echo incident. And what we demonstrated based on Jameson's testimony, which again we shared with Salas, was that actually it was eight days later on the 25th of March uh, 1967. I believe, now you need to check my chapter, and again, this is a memory thing I've got going on. It was either the 24th or the 25th of, of March, but it was it was eight days after the Echo incident. Uh, Jameson's was eight days after the Echo. Uh, uh. Uh, correct, and the reason we know that is he said the same night that he was called down to the hangar and told, you know, Oscar's flight has gone down all 10 missiles. You know, we want you to go out and bring them up uh, with the other teams or several targeting teams that went out. But the same time they were briefed and told all of that, they said, but there's something going on. We want, you know, we, we, we want what he was told by his superiors was there's still UFO activity in the field. We're going to let that die down before we send you out to the missiles. So meanwhile, as you'll read in that chapter, um, Jameson wandered into a temporary command post and they were listening to Air Force personnel talking on the radio to the people in the hangar where he was. Those people were out at a place called French Cooley and uh, it's a canyon near Belt, Montana. And what they were describing on the radio was this UFO had landed at the bottom of this canyon and Air Force personnel had sort of, you know, ringed the area, but it was night and this was a very steep canyon. They didn't, weren't going to try to go down and investigate the light that night. Well, that uh, event at Belt, uh, near Belt in French Cooley, actually there were some civilians involved. They talked to the local media, the Great Falls Tribune, and there was actually a news story about the incident at Belt, Montana the next day. And so we can target, we, well, we can correlate the fact that the incident being described the next day in the local newspapers had occurred the night before. It was the same incident that Jameson was describing. Therefore, we can pinpoint the exact date in March that he went out to, to Oscar's flight. And, you know, Bob Salas never had any of that information. Um, it was Jameson who provided all of that, which allowed us to, to select the exact date. And that was called Belt Canyon? Belt, well, the town is Belt. And uh, the, the place, the canyon, uh, is called French Cooley, C-O-U-L-E-E, 
which uh, is a geographic feature, meaning like a, a you know a depression or a, a canyon. But um, that's the proper name of the, the canyon right outside of Belt, where this incident took place. And what is the state that Belt is in? Montana. It's Montana. right outside of Great. You know, all this took place in, in near Great Falls, Montana. Malmstrom is just east of Great Falls, Montana. And all of the missile sites are arranged around the, across the Montana countryside. Is it, Belt is approximately five miles southeast of Malmstrom Air Force Base. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, um, uh, in my, I, I interviewed uh, uh, Bob yesterday, and uh, he, uh, I'd have to pull my notes up, but he had mentioned that there was some kind of, um, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, there was some kind of uh coupling circuit that Boeing determined was the, the kind of uh, the point of failure that that uh, threw off the guidance system uh, as a logic coupler uh, I believe it yes okay and then uh, you know and that integrated with the inertial navigation system uh, uh, so what I noted was uh, they were able to Boeing was able to determine that a blip, a uh, particular voltage and a particular frequency was sent down to the missiles, and that's what threw them all off. Is that? And that's correct. And um, the, the thing that he has emphasized and I have emphasized, and based on my discussion with missile maintenance personnel, is that each one of those missiles is connected to a launch control facility. Uh, that's the underground facility a capsule, launch capsule, where the two Air Force launch officers are located. Above it, there's a, a building where all the security police are located. And uh, But that facility, the LCF, Launch Control Facility, is connected by cables to 10 missiles. Each flight, as they are called, a flight of missiles is 10 missiles connected to a central launch control facility. Each silo is called an LF, a launch facility, as opposed to the launch control facility. Each one of those cables is independent. So whatever the UFO, those in the UFO did, they independently sent this noise, as it's been referred to, electronic noise. They injected it into 10 separate cables somehow. Um, so they independently brought down all 10 missiles. And this has occurred multiple times based on the testimony that, you know, I've taken from various veterans at various bases there have been these, you know, missile mal multiple missile malfunctions. Um, so that's in essence what went on. And uh, the systems that were affected, at least in that case, w involved what, what's called the GNC, Guidance and Control System. And my understanding is there's a component that the maintenance personnel have referred to as a can, a GNC can, uh, GN, like uh, like an ampersand, and uh, GNC can, guidance and control can, that contains all of those components, including, I'm sure, the logic coupler. And so what, what they had to do is the maintenance personnel had to come out the next day and remove this can with all these electronic components and replace it with another can. Um, so that, that's in essence my understanding what went on. Do you, um, mm -hmm. do you know, uh, uh, was was it determined if the logic coupler had been fried? I mean, I, I'm guessing that something was damaged if they had to replace it. It wasn't something that a, a power reset could have fixed. You, you'd, have, it, you'd have to ask Salas that, whether the port tried would be an appropriate term. However, um, uh, another veteran whom I interviewed, who was missile maintenance, um, referred to melted electronics, and he was involved in the same series of incidents at Malmstrom in '67. So, uh, what he was describing were, you know, high temperature melting of electronic circuits, and um, so, you know, when front when. Dallas used the terms fry that that may you know be exactly what he's referring to do you know in in the subsequent subsequent cases 
was the point of failure the same? Um, it seems to vary from incident to incident. Um, in, in other cases, for example, in the 1970s, uh, the veterans have referred to targeting codes, you know, the actual uh, uh, targets, uh, you know, the, the uh, latitude and longitude of a given target, let's say Moscow, uh, would be would be input into a given missile. So that particular missile would, would be correlated um, in particularly latitude and longitude for Moscow. In some cases, rather than uh, these other electronics issues being described as being affected, what the witnesses are telling me, again, missile maintenance personnel had to do more with the actual codes, that program codes that would have allowed the target to be hit were scrambled or erased altogether. In other words, the software rather than the hardware was affected. So there do seem to have been a there does seem to have been a diversity of modalities of different um, failure modes. Um, you know, from case to case. How many? Uh, how many? Ha- did did on the targeting aspect? How many? How many cases would you say that that was described to you? One case, a dozen times? Uh, and that, you know, we're talking 40 years of data that I have, so, and some of which I, you know, summarize in my book. So I, I think quantifying those cases would be risky for me to do it with any kind of accuracy. But if I had to guess, which is all it is without me going and consulting all of my notes, uh, and I would say that the descriptions of targeted targeting codes being altered or erased, um, maybe a dozen, and that's over you know a several decade period. Now the thing to keep in mind is, uh, you know, my research is catch as catch can. I've got to either hear about a veteran who's willing to talk or they seek me out proactively and or, or other researchers, but I'm the primary guy they've gone to over the years. I mean, uh, Salas knows a great deal about his own incident and a peripheral amount of information about other incidents. But as far as comprehensive summation of what's taken place decade after decade, uh, I'm the one with the primary database. Um, and, you know, that's what I focused on. That's what I've written about publicly. That's what I've asked veterans in articles to, you know, and in my lectures to approach me on. So it's, you know, it's logical that I would have the largest amount of information. But all of that said, uh, I, you know, I'm guessing that realistically, I only know about a very small percentage of the overall number of cases worldwide uh, going back 60, 70 years. I mean, there's no way that uh, I've had veterans in every case that would, that every incident that occurred, someone seeks me out. I mean, that's just highly improbable. So I suspect that there are a great many more cases that have taken place that I know nothing about because no one has approached me with, with information. Do, uh, I, when I was talking to Bob and I, I brought up, uh, asked him, uh, the way I posed the question was, I know this wasn't the case in your instance, but can you tell me, had you heard of any other instances of targeting uh, uh, being tampered with? And he absolutely would not touch it. And I and uh, and I asked, uh, you know, and then I reframed it and I said, if if you were me, would that be a subject that you would look into? And he said, friend, I'm not going to talk about targeting. And, you know, of course, I dropped it at that point. So my question is. Uh, Friend, I'm not going to talk about targeting. I'll I'll never <laughs> I'll never forget that. You know, when you talk to folks in, you know, of course we have relationships with uh, you know folks in uh, intelligence, defense, um, and you're always asking questions, trying to get some information. But there, when you've gone too far, there's kind of a change in the tone of their voice and and their response, and that was what it was with, with Bob Salas. Friend, I'm not gonna talk about targeting. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting, and again, we have a, a, the second part of this interview, which I think has some even more fascinating perspectives from Robert Hastings. We'll, we'll announce the air date on that soon. Uh, but Vinny, yeah, uh, thoughts? 
I mean, it is so good hearing um, from Robert Hastings, isn't it? I mean, to be able to find those sorts of finer details and, you know, correlate a lot of the information, especially when it comes to the, the 67 case at Malmstrom and finding out the dates and the differences in time between Oscar flight and Echo flight. And it's just adding to that kind of wealth of data. And, you know, hats off to Robert Salas for, for following this through for so many decades and keeping it you know, fresh in people's minds. But with this kind of work that Robert Hastings has done over the years, it just adds so much more to it. When you hear him say that he's spoken to 167 other personnel, you know, and that there are, you know, multiple incidents at Malmstrom and, and across other missile sites and ICBM, you know, locations, it's, it's just incredible. And, you know, hats off to him. Amazing man. Uh, yeah, it, it truly is. And, and the work and dedication that he has shown to this, I, I don't think that anyone would be, uh, I think the chances would be very low that anyone would be aware of the tampering of our nuclear weapon systems had it not been for, for Hastings' uh, book. Uh, I mean, that, that was really something else. You know, one of, one of the things, and of course we've heard this brought up by other folks as well, um, you know, Robert brought up this point. He said, quote, if you don't have the history of the situation, it's hard to evaluate what's going on now. I mean, so many of the skeptics ranging from, uh, you know, scientists to, let's say, uh, persons in Congress, uh, and even just the public in general, they're saying, well, uh, are these craft uh, Chinese or Russian technology? And he goes on to, to say here, and if you realize that the very same craft, maneuver, speed, you know, radar signatures, all of that, the whole nine yards, if you look at what's going on now, it's identical to what went on in the 1940s. It's, it's highly improbable, he goes on to claim, that these are, you know, man-made craft in 2022, let alone 1945. So to claim that this technology was was Russian or Chinese back in the 40s is absurd. <laughs> it certainly is absurd, but the folks that keep uh, going back to that excuse. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. If you're looking, if you're fairly new to the subject, if you're only focusing on everything that's kind of been happening recently, then you've just got this narrow view, unfortunately, of of the bigger picture. Because if you could go back and research and look into all the cases, you'll find that there are so many that are very rarely talked about that have exactly the same, same type of data sets to the things that have happened in more recent years. And, you know, to have that overall wide vision on the subject is nothing but beneficial to anybody, whether you're a researcher or just someone who's passionate about the subject, you can learn a lot. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one, of, one of the more interesting aspects that I had completely forgotten about was him speaking about uh, his time as a teenager working at the air traffic control tower at Malmstrom. And I had totally forgotten as well that his dad was, was stationed there. And what a sort of uh, interesting coincidence that Bob Salas uh, was there. What what struck you about that? I know I know for me it was him describing observing these targets at this air traffic FAA air traffic control radar. Uh, what anything else that kind of struck you about that? I thought it was pretty fascinating. Yeah, I thought it really showed his persistence how he kept going back to this gentleman Glasser, I think his name was, uh, you know, to sort of ask him these questions about are you tracking these targets, these UFOs and you know, and he says himself, this is how his kind of interest really started. And, and it just shows that he's obviously carried on that persistence throughout the decades to be able to get all this information that he's put out in his excellent book and, and the documentary. And, you know, it is such a shame that he isn't doing interviews these days due to his poor health. You know, I wish him all the best, but, you know, the man has done so much and it's a shame that we don't get to hear from him because you could have him on multiple podcasts and we could learn so much more information. He might just remember little bits here and there that just really paint this really big picture. And yeah, again, hats off to the man. Yeah, yeah, really, really something else. I, I, I thought that was what was interesting as well was his, and, and again, in full disclosure, I haven't read the book in, in, in quite a while, but him touching on the, uh, the chapter, and I, I don't recall the chapter, but where he interviewed subsequent Malmstrom air traffic controllers who stated that, that these vehicles had been observed uh, coming from, I'm guessing, kind of low Earth orbit uh, down into uh, the base and, and disabling these uh, or, or outright tampering with these weapons. Um, you know, another one, another thing that I thought was interesting, too, was 
his dad recalling to him being in, um, I guess it was sort of the, the lower building of the air traffic control facility where on the sort of uh, uh, public, uh, not public, uh, 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 you know, sort of party classified radio line amongst the launch control centers that, that, uh, that there was a UAP that, that had uh, landed in, uh, in, a, in a coulee in French Canyon. That was pretty, pretty wild. And I think it just kind of goes on to uh, corroborate a lot of, um, you know, what kind of what happened afterwards. What did you think about that? It was, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it goes to show that there's a lot of incidents and cases from that period around the nuclear missile sites that we don't know about. You know, we know the Air Force were involved a lot. There's probably a lot of information that they're, they're sitting on. But, you know, you mentioned as well that that case in French Cooley, there were civilians involved as well. You know, it'd be great to kind of hear from those kind of people as well. It's It just shows the wealth of, of cases. And you're talking about landings, not just lights in the sky or or you know, weapons being tampered with. It's, it's everything across the board. You know, a landing is, is huge. I, I definitely agree. And if you, you know, if you go back on our channel, if you look at our interview with Mario Woods, who was an above ground security policeman, I don't recall if it was at Malmstrom, but he was an above ground security policeman uh, stationed with a nuclear missile, uh, stationed at a nuclear missile uh, wing or, or squadron. You know, he went into great detail about when he was sent out to a launch facility, which is, they call them an LF, it's basically where the, IC, the silo, the ICBM sits in, um, that the launch control center, which uh, Salas and, and other nuclear launch control officers sat in, uh, they received, in addition to interference with the nuclear weapons, they had received uh, both exterior and interior intrusion alarms at the missile silo. And uh, uh, Mario Woods uh, and his uh, partner, they went out uh, to that particular launch facility that they were sent to, and he goes into great detail about what happened to him, um, which is really one of the most powerful interviews I, I think that we've, we've ever done. Um, you know, one of the things I think that is really fascinating about all of this, if you, if you think about it, the fact that it's a, such a large chunk of missiles knocked offline. And um, I remember in speaking with uh, David Shindley, who we had on recently when we were discussing uh, his experience with Sean Kirkpatrick and, and Arrow, um, you know, he had, he had noted that these cables, you know, they're electronically shielded. So for most people that, uh, most people aren't aware that when a nuclear weapon detonates, it generates a, 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 a electromagnetic electromagnetic pulse called EMP, and it can fry any sort of electronics uh, whenever a, a weapon detonates. So in order to protect against that, all of these nuclear missile systems, they are, are heavily shielded against EMP. So you have this one center uh, that with the two launch control officers that are in charge of a flight of 10 nuclear missiles, Minuteman one nuclear missiles, and and whatever this UAP did was able to send a signal down each individual line. And these lines, it's, I've seen photos of it. The cable bun bundle is about this, this big, and it's buried about four feet uh, below, uh, below the, the, the ground. I mean, that's, that's really, it's, it's insane that, uh, that they are able to do it. But it just shows you there's no way it's any sort of interference with Russia or, or China, don't you think? Absolutely. I mean, these are the, the details. You know, we hear about them shutting down nukes. When you look at the details about what they actually had to do to independently shut down these systems, it, it's, it boggles the mind. It really does. And, you know, I think, you know, without spoiling too much for more of the interview, it isn't just nukes getting sort of switched off. It's, it's quite the opposite in some cases as well, where these things are getting activated. And, you know, there's a multitude of effects that these UFOs or objects have, have caused. It's, it's wild. And, and, and we will. We are going to get into that. Robert, in the next interview, does speak extensively about, about those cases and some other thoughts that he has on it. Um, but I, I think a point that is really, I, I, I would think, I would hope that our lawmakers are really digging into this. Clearly, these cases are not something where 
it was just kind of a temporary thing. They were able to power down the missile, power it back up, and boom, they're online. Most of these cases, these things were knocked knocked offline for you know for more than a day. And I think, in particular, with Salas's case, and I understand this to be the case with others, is the fact that this uh, guidance and control mechanism, uh, this this electronic can that sits in the head of the missile that uh, has the the circuit that, that couples the launch control center with the missile itself, it also manages the inertial navigation system, that this noise that was sent down the line, the, the trunk line to the individual missiles, physically fried the electronics in the canister. So, you know, if you think about it, with any sort, you know, if your TV or your cable box goes glitchy, what's the first thing you do? You power it down, power it back up, and poof, it, nine times out of 10, it works. However, <laughs> the, the fact that, that these missile technicians had to go through and completely replace these cans is, is evidence right there that these vehicles have offensively tampered and uh, displayed the ability to to uh, affect the hardware of the missile. I mean, that's really pretty alarming if you think about it. It is. I mean, again, you think of people talking about it being Russia or China. You know, these advanced objects or whatever they are are really just highlighting the vulnerabilities of these systems, which, you know, are, are, are like with those 10 ICBMs, they're on separate lines, you know, it, to, to be that consistent in shutting these things down. In 1967 as well, I mean, this isn't something that's just happened in the last few years. Right. All of these things don't, these, these things don't add up to being a foreign adversary in my book. Yeah, they, they, they definitely do not. And, you know, and one of the things, like I said, I've been a student of Russian and nuclear, uh, Russian and U.S. nuclear policy since the early 90s. Um, one of, uh, particularly Russia, uh, a what it, what would be considered an act of war, um, and would certainly trigger a response from a country is uh, active jamming or interference with a nuclear weapon system, or in particular, nuclear command and control system, which uh, NC3 is what it's commonly referred to as. So. Um, and even Putin has has uh, spoken about this. This was before uh, you know, the, the current Ukrainian situation. But that is a red line. So, um, you know, I spoke earlier about an EMP pulse. So in sort of uh, classic uh, sort of um, U.S. or not U.S., nuclear, nuclear warfare 101, one of the first things that occurs is the attacking country uh, goes and detonates a nuclear weapon, usually two or three, above the country at a very high altitude. The higher the altitude that the that the weapon uh, explodes, the the larger the coverage of the EMP pulse. And the purpose of that is to degrade command and control. So, if the if uh, a nuke goes off, the president, uh, if if your NC three is degraded, that can uh, that can affect your ability to respond to a offensive kinetic uh, kinetic strike. So, with that with that said, and and this particular um, sort of incident comes off as interference with nuclear command and control, at least at the local level of of the missiles. Um, that that is just something another country would not do because if you're if your country and all of a sudden your nc3 goes offline you immediately know that the the second thing that is going to happen is a wave of incoming missiles so to think that this is just kind of interference uh, random interference by some country that's going to mess around with our nuclear control uh, command and control is is just um, is really just yeah, I don't understand how uh, some people, some of the skeptics have, have said that maybe it was that. And as a matter of fact, there was a later incident, I believe we actually uh, talk about it uh, in, the, in the subsequent uh, interview, where uh, there was a documented case that was in the Atlantic of a large swath of our land-based nuclear missiles, Minuteman 3s, uh, several squadrons or, or approximately half of our land-based strategic nuclear was knocked offline. Now, the Air Force said it was due to a circuit board that, that blew up, but yeah, I, I, I don't think so. What did you think about his comments um, 
you know, we, uh, one of the questions I posed was this: the frying of the GNC circuitry in the in the IC intercontinental ballistic missiles was that the main failure mode? And he brought up, well, actually, targeting has been tampered with. Uh, what did you think about that? I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it? And let, let, let's just keep. If this was genuinely a non-human intelligence there and they're trying to show us, you know, the, the issues that they have with us having nuclear weapons, then, you know, to show that if a target if a target is highlighted, say, as Moscow, as Robert Hastings said, then, you know, what's to say that they could change the target to, you know, a, a destination within the, the, the continental United States or something like that? You know, it seems that they have the ability to alter software as well as hardware, you know, and it's just showing this this power that they have. Yeah, the uh, you know, what's interesting, too, is uh, I'd have to go back and, and read some of my old history, but I believe in the Minuteman, the Minuteman 1 targeting information was actually uploaded off of a tape uh, into the into the uh, into the warhead in yeah. in uh, in uh, the subsequent versions of the Minuteman platform in the Minuteman 2 and 3. All of that targeting information, especially with the Minuteman Three, which held individual warheads, was all uploaded uh, electronically uh, in what are called war plans. So the person at the at the console can select a target package set, which are individual war plan numbers, uh, and to think that those were tampered with and is just insane, uh, and you know, and frankly, frankly, scary. I know, I think back in, in early May, or maybe it must have been in 22, there was a question, I believe, by uh, Congressman Mike Gallagher regarding the, the uh, Momstrom incident. Do you think, in your opinion, and I know you're on the, other cro uh, on the other side of the pond, do you think that American lawmakers are aware of the history of this, or they just don't want to talk about it? I think it's potentially a mixed bag. I think some are, some aren't. You know, a lot of these congressmen and, and women, I think they do rely on their staffers to kind of get all the background knowledge on a lot of this uh, this subject. So, I mean, I always just go back to that moment when Moultrie and Bray were asked if they were aware of Malmstrom and they just looked <laughs> like just completely blank. I, that was hilarious. Yeah, I, I nicknamed uh, I nicknamed uh, them uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Plausible and Mr. Deniability. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a, a fairly a fairly common uh, common tactic. I, I and kind of touching, we touched upon this uh, with Arrow. Uh, they, Sean Kirkpatrick, uh, who is not going to be there very much longer. Uh, is uh, they they really kind of glossed over. The, the testimony, the telephone testimony from David Shindley and Robert Salas, we, we played a recording that he, that he had uh, of his Arrow interview. But it, it seems to me in general that, that from what I've been told by these, these folks that have testified to Arrow, that there seems to be a general lack of interest on Arrow's part in really documenting um, these, these nuclear cases. Do you think it's because they maybe already have information or it's because it's, it's, uh, this occurred 50 years ago, it's just not as important? I, I can't decide. Yeah, no, it's difficult to say, isn't it? I think whether they have already got evidence of some of these cases documented, to hear it from another individual you know, is more data and that is surely what they want. You know, Sean Kirkpatrick has always stated that he's following the scientific method. Well, the more data that you have to analyze, then the better kind of you can get to, to a conclusion or an answer on anything. So to, just to see them just being quite blasé about taking this testimony, just taking basic notes over the phone and not really showing a lot of interest. It's beyond me. Some might say that it was at the early days of Arrow when they were understaffed and they didn't have the right policies in place you know, to, to, to get this information down properly. I think that's a pretty bad excuse. You know, they should be, <laughs> they should be, uh, be able to do that. But again, it's, it's, it's tough to really know. I mean, I'd like to think that now with we're hearing they've got 40 plus staff members now that, you know, they might have some better things in place. You know, we heard from Chris Mellon today about the, um, what was it, Arrow, uh, talking about this new, more transparent, um, classification guide. I mean, is it too little too late? That's the kind of question I ask myself. Is it, it just doesn't seem, I'm just not that 
confident in them at all. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I. I uh, so I. I had spoken to this launch control officer, David David Shindley, and and he had he debriefed me on on how it went with Arrow, and uh, you know I'd been uh, in touch with. Uh, we'll just say officials on Capitol Hill. So I, I wrote a sort of executive summary of this debrief uh, of, of what, uh, how this went with Kirkpatrick and Arrow, and I sent it to, uh, to folks on Capitol Hill that I've been in touch with for quite some time. And I, I think they were a bit um, probably uh, shocked and disappointed uh, as far as how uh, Arrow handled that. And, you know, and the unfortunate thing is other, other folks in the nuclear world, other whistleblowers that we've spoken to that have chatted with Arrow, have, it, they, it, it, one person said the Keystone cops could have done, done a better job than how their interview was handled. And the fact that, uh, you know, you've got these, these, uh, these former, um, you know, a lot of these are, are Air Force Academy graduates uh, that went and provided extremely detailed testimony to Arrow and then to find out they didn't even bother to record anything and the notes that they took were probably as good as my note taking when I was in eighth grade social <laughs> studies, which wasn't very good. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really, um, yeah, that's really, really uh, something. Yeah, I... I He's not going to be there longer, much longer. So uh, anyway, hopefully there will be a, a positive change in Arrow, uh, I, would, uh, I would hope. And I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of really good people that are working there. Uh, it's, never an, a, uh, it's never a monolithic, monolithic uh, type thing. So uh, Vinny, now I understand you've, you have some really great guests coming up on Disclosure Team. Really great show, folks. If you are not subscribing to Disclosure Team on YouTube or on Twitter, uh, you got to do it. Uh, Vinny gets some really great guests. Uh, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so I've, I've been, you know, pretty consistent for throughout the last couple of years and just continuously trying to bring on a, a mixture of new guests, obviously, but also returning guests when they've got new bodies of work out, whether it be new books, etc. So, I mean, for the, the foreseeable, the next few weeks, um, Dr. David Clark's going to come back on and talk about the, the Welsh Triangle and the Broadhaven school case from the 1970s. Then Dr. Diana Posolka is coming back on to talk about her new book, Encounters, uh, followed by Rich Hoffman of the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. Um, I haven't spoken to Rich properly in about a year and a half, so it'd be good to kind of have an update from him on, on the work the SCU are up to and, and his views on the current climate with what's happening in the subject. And then uh, Bob McGuire, Science Bob's going to come back on as well. I love him. Again. Yeah, a bit of a catch up with Bob. So uh, yeah, it'd be a good month. Yeah, I love it. I, yeah, I love Spaced Out Radio as well. I've I've been on their show a couple of times, and and Dave Scott, uh, who has a beard, one one could uh, only only uh, <laughs> uh, I always have beard envy. And what a, what a great guy. He's been very helpful to me as well. Um, and folks, if you've enjoyed the show, please do us a solid and hit that subscribe button on YouTube, follow on Twitter, leave a comment, share, like all that good stuff. It helps us get our message out. And uh, we also need to keep the lights on so you can become a supporter of The Good Trouble Show by going to www.patreon.com forward slash The Good Trouble Show. And for the price of a Starbucks coffee, you can support our work. Also on YouTube, our Super Chats have been open and are a great way to show your appreciation uh, for our work and it helps us bring you great content such as uh, having our friend uh, Vinny on. And I also want to thank our chat moderators uh, and uh, uplifting tweets for the great, uh, the great graphics work. Um, and yeah, we, uh, we, we, we decided to put our little commercial at the back end rather uh, at, at the front end. So, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, uh, Vinny, thanks as always. As I've always said, you were the very first, uh, very first Person, uh, you and uh, and Dan Zetterstrom were the very first sort of UFO uh, UAP celebrities to come on my show, and uh, <laughs> I I, rem I remember that day and how how fucking nervous I was. I was like, holy shit, what am I getting into? But I uh, always appreciate the generosity of your time. And uh, oh, let's see here, uh, uh, Subwater seventy eight. Uh, uh, thanks for the compliment. He, he loved our show today. And uh, Wildcat uh, Hone, thank you for the uh, for uh, for the super chat. Vinny, when is your uh, when is uh, you may have said it earlier when I was multitasking and didn't quite catch it. When is your your next show? And how do we find you? 
uh, the best thing to do is just search Disclosure Team on any kind of platform. And if I've got, uh, if I'm on it, you'll find it. It's the, the, the typical black and white logo that a lot of people seem to be familiar with now. But my next show actually drops tomorrow night, and that's one awesome. I recorded last week. So uh, yeah, go ahead, go subscribe and share, comment, all that good stuff. It's much appreciated. Yeah, folks, on on all of these things. Part of getting your your or our our content, Vinny's uh, other folks that are doing a, a lot of really good work on it, the the likes and the comments. That's what the algorithm sees, and that is what causes the platform to organically suggest the content to other people that may not know about your show. So it really it helps all of us out, uh, be it on podcasts, YouTube. Uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, whatever. All of those little clicks and likes that you do, they, they, really, uh, they really do a lot. Uh, Vinny, thanks so much for joining us. And um, yeah, we don't know when we're gonna come back with this, with the second part of our interview. Uh, I did speak to Robert today and uh, he has uh, been very grateful for everyone's support and, um, you know, and really working to get, get the word out. And folks, e Call your congressman here in the U.S. Call your lawmakers. Let them know that UAP transparency is your American right to know our place in the universe. Benny, thanks again for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you soon, man. Take care. Take care. Thank you. You're welcome.